But he knew what a wonderful God. And the one day in the scripture, when he prayed, he, he cried out, you know, Oh God, you are awesome and you are great. And I realized that we do truly, we truly do get buddy buddy with the Lord sometimes. And we forget how wonderful he really is. We take him for granted. And he is a wonderful savior. He laid his life down. He gave his life. Nobody took his life. He gave it for us. So sing, sing your hearts to the Lord and let him know what a wonderful Savior he is. Oh, my heart sings today, sings for joy and gladness. Jesus saves, shall despise, takes away my sadness. Youth is God, peace is mine, peace I can sing a song because we know it it's old the second verse says once a slave now i'm free free from condemnation jesus gives liberty and a full salvation now the chains of the past have been all forgiven and my name is inscribed in the book of heaven aren't you glad today that your chains are gone amen, amen. praise the lord let's sing that second verse once a slave, now I'm free, free from condemnation. Jesus gives liberty and the full salvation. Now the chains of the past have been all forgiven. And my name is inscribed in the book of heaven. Wonderful, wonderful, Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, fighting on his feet. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning as we prepare our hearts for prayer, I want us to be thinking about some of the requests that have been listed and others that maybe haven't been listed. Comes to mind uh, George Lunger. I got to see him yesterday at uh, Parkside. And, and uh, George physically is really, really struggling. 
and though he uh, mentally is there and completely aware and able to have a conversation and, uh, and through my conversation yesterday I know that George is getting frustrated and uh, perhaps ready to uh, to go on to a greater reward but we just want to be lifting I know Julie's here I know that sure and Bev and the kids have been struggling with this it is an overwhelming overwhelming situation that they're in so just be really lifting them a prayer this morning and my heart also goes out and remember of course Barb was in the hospital in Cleveland this past week and and uh, you know I was very surprised to see her at breakfast yesterday and and with all that she's going through all her physical ailments is still able to smile and able to cheer others on and it reminds me of that great cloud of witnesses <laughs> You don't have to wait to get to heaven to be a cheerleader for the faith of others. And we want to continue to remember uh, Ethan, their grandson, six years old, and possible heart attack, collapsed in a restaurant and is on bed rest and going to chill Akron Children's tomorrow to be uh, to be checked out. So we want to be uh, lifting uh, Ethan up as well. Uh, so many other requests. Uh, Mark Manning is still in uh, Salem Hospital. Mildred McLaughlin is recovering at, in uh, Circle Care behind the hospital. Janine Duvall, uh, Mildred's mom, was in a car wreck. I found out when I went to see Mildred that uh, a serious car accident and shoulder damage. And Terry Ellison having knee surgery this week and, and so many other needs. And we don't want to forget that Shirley Graham had her knee replacement and she's staying with a friend and is recovering. Jane Barnes' mom. And please especially want to remember Marianne and Austin this morning. I got a call early yesterday morning. Marianne's mom uh, was passed away in a house fire in her home yesterday morning very early. And we don't be lifted. I know it's a difficult time to lose someone that you love. And also just, you know, sometimes there can be family situations. And, and uh, you know, all of us have dysfunctional families. And something like this can either be a time to draw together in God's healing. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're trusting in this situation. And all of these, and there's still others. And I want you to look around. You, most of us sit where we normally sit. As I've been looking around today, Hugo and Janet have not been able to be here much because Janet's been ill and Hugo's not been here. And, and, and Rich Elliser that sits in that back row has sat there faithfully. And I know he doesn't stay for other things. And so often it's easy when they don't stay for Sunday school, you forget. But on Sunday mornings, we need to be aware, congregation, of those who normally we think are here and not here. And where are they at? And who is praying for them? Who is contacting them? And I got to tell you, I'd love to, as the pastor, to be the one that, that greets people and talks to them. But it is a profound difference maker when you, each and every one of us, look and just call, just send a card, just be a friend, just be there for somebody who's maybe going through a difficult time that they haven't shared. Maybe they haven't been involved in a small group or a life class or, or maybe they haven't been involved in, in some of the other activities. But we are those who are the body of Christ and we have a responsibility to one another. This next song is called The Stand. And, and you know, I think God calls us to stand. And Apostle Paul said, after doing everything that you know to do to be able to stand, and it doesn't seem like anything's working. Paul says, then just stand. Stand your ground. Stand your faith. Stand your hope. Maybe you need to stand beside somebody else whose hope is waning. Maybe you need to stand behind next to somebody else who is struggling physically and, and is very ill and they haven't shared it with anyone. Maybe you need to stand next to one who is here this morning who's, who is struggling with doubts and, and wondering, I've been away for weeks. Does anybody care? Does anybody care? And I know we do, but it takes a determined effort to be aware of those in our lives when they become fixtures that we get used to seeing and we don't notice when they're not there. Church, we need to pull together. And I encourage you, take a stand this week. Think, let God, during this prayer, during this, this, this song, I want you to let God bring somebody to your heart that maybe used to be a part of this congregation, a part of this fellowship, somebody you haven't seen in a while, somebody whose paths you cross, but you've never asked them, why don't you come to church? Why aren't you involved with us? Why don't you come and let us pray for you? Why don't you be a part of what we're doing? This is the time, folks, to pull together and be the body of Christ. I could be mentioning names of people in this congregation 
who are struggling with family situations, who are struggling with work situations, who are struggling with financial situations. And I want to encourage you this morning, church, we need to pull together as the body of Christ. As we sing this song, these altars are open, and I would invite you to come and and just to gather at these altars. But I'm going to challenge you to do something different. I want you to look in this congregation, and I want you to let God lay somebody in your heart. I want you to go stand next to them. Maybe put a hand on their shoulder. Maybe go get a hold of their hand. And maybe as we're singing, and maybe during prayer, you just form a prayer huddle and group right where you're at, and you just pray with them. God said, "My house shall be called a house of convenience." Well, you don't have to get up too early, and you don't have to stay too late. You don't have to give too much. It doesn't cost too much of your time. Fit it in where it works. Don't come if somebody doesn't be nice to you. Don't come if it costs you too much to do it. Is that what he said? My house should be called a house of prayer. Because unless we get in communion with God in our prayer life, then we can't have communion with one another in our fellowship life. So right now as we sing this song, go and be with somebody and if God doesn't lay somebody in your heart you see somebody sitting by themselves or you're by yourself go and be joined to a group and just form prayer groups all over this congregation this morning I want us to pray I want some of you praying for the needs the physical needs I want some of you come and maybe a few of you stand right here where Hugo and Janet and, and they have been struggling Janet's been so physically struggling and some of you come and stand and gather around and pray for them right there in that spot some of you go to that back seat over there where Rich normally sits and gather around there two or three and just pray for Rich Elliser. It's Helen and Helen Hoffman's dad. Gather around and pray. Church, let's just spend these next few moments gathered together in prayer for one another and lifting our hearts to God and asking him to come in the fullness of his power this morning. Let's take a stand together. Oh, my God. 
is the place where we are free in Christ and free to be all that it's called us to be in Christ. Church, if we can't lift one another up here, how will we ever do it in a world that's hostile to the Jesus we serve? Church, this is the age to be brave, Amen. to be Amen. bold, to be courageous. Every time the words ring in my mind again and again, Senior night was last week. It was Duran scripture, so it stuck out of my mind because I've tried to instill it in my kids God's words and Moses' words to Joshua as he was to cross in and to take what the Lord had promised. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. Church. Being strong and courageous in a world that doesn't know Christ starts by being strong and courageous as a body of Christ gathered in this place, in this day. The work begins here. The work begins now. And it's a work of boldness, not by might, not by power, but through my spirit, says the Lord, will we accomplish his work in this world. It's a church one more time, I implore you, encourage you. There's a lot of huddles, people gathering around. If you want to go now, ask that Shelly and the praise team would sing that chorus again. I'm going to ask Don Rosbach if he would maybe come and lead us in corporate prayer. But let's just come and gather together as the body of Christ. Be strong and courageous this morning. Get up and move to a place of, 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 of comfort, of joining together hearts and mind and spirit with each other to take a stand that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if it can't get done here in the body that represents him on earth, then it won't get done in the world in which we live. Let's come together and make a stand in prayer this morning. So high I'll stand with arms high and arms abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. So high Gracious Heavenly Father, we stand and kneel and cry and shout and whisper to you, O oh Lord, and we know in all these ways you still hear us. Sometimes I am hesitant to go with you in prayer, Lord, because I think what I have to ask or to say is so insignificant. But in my heart of hearts, Lord, I know that you are with us, with me, wherever I am, whatever I do, whatever I ask. I oftentimes have to remind myself as I look around in this world of ours, as I see the wonders of your universe, I begin to say to myself, how could I possibly doubt the power of this wondrous God who gave his only son to die for us on the cross so that we could live with God in heaven for eternity? Think of the alternative. I don't even want to think about the alternative, Heavenly Father. Be with us all wherever we're at, whatever our prayer, whatever our needs. Heavenly Father, we know you are with us always, and we ask you to continue to be with us. 
we that need to even whisper your name, whisper prayer. And we know that you're here us, and we know that you're with us, Heavenly Father. Be with us this day and always, Lord Jesus, as we come to you in prayer this day and every day of the week, Lord Jesus. Help us to be reminded that you are with us all days, and all we need to do is to open our hearts to you, Heavenly Father. Help us to do that this day. And join me, Heavenly Father, and join me, church, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I get some of you to gather around. Sue was asked to be anointed for Crystal Hellman. Crystal has uh, been back and forth to Cleveland again and still no for sure answers from the doctors. But we're not asking for answers from the doctor today. We're asking for answers from our daddy who loves her. And whether he heals her or not is irrelevant. Because his love overcomes even the illnesses, even the losses of this life. Father, we lift up our sister Crystal to you. Lord, we know what a blessing her life has been to this family. So long her life was outside of the confines of knowing a, a church home and a church family. And Lord, her and Danny have been such a powerful blessing. And, and what a blessing it has been to see their faith blossom and their eagerness to serve you and their eagerness to express your love everywhere they go. Thank you, Lord, that you use each of us broken and broken down vessels. And yet you don't look at us for what we offer. You look at us because you offer us love, acceptance, peace, wholeness, value and worth in our lives and purpose, the purpose of knowing you, the purpose of making you known. And so, Lord, we lift up Crystal right now. Touch these lungs, Lord. Reduce, Lord, if the doctors won't, if the doctors can't, you can. Hear the plea of our heart and make these lungs fit in her body and take the pressure off of her heart. Give her the breath, your breath, the breath of life. May she breathe easy. May she breathe deep. Lord Jesus, may she be able to continue in the path of service and of love and of dedicating her life to you, unencumbered by the physical ailments that she suffers now. And Lord, whether you choose to heal or not, we praise your name. For Lord, our goal isn't to live in this life forever, but our goal is to live this life in honor and praise of you, knowing that in our greatest weakness, your strength is perfected. So Lord, perfect your strength in crystal right now, in this place, in this moment, on this day. And Lord, we give you the praise that you are working out your will in her life, and we trust her life completely to you. Lord, we anoint Sue for Crystal in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the sure hope, and the certain trust that your will is being accomplished and will be done. And we praise your name forever for your love and your faithfulness, God. In your name we pray.
I'm going to move back here. I know Bruce is having surgery this this week as well on his knee, so I'm going to come and just somebody gather around Bruce. Let's anoint him for his surgery this Wednesday. Heavenly Father, we want to lift up our brother Bruce to you in this knee, and Lord, we thank you that you care for even the smallest details of our lives. And Lord, I thank you for Bruce's uh, leadership in the way that he is not afraid to pray for anyone, anywhere, at any time, for anything. And Lord, give us that boldness to just stop and say, let me pray for you, strangers and, and friends and acquaintances alike, Lord. May you use Bruce as he's in this uh, hospital and, and as the surgeon and the anesthesia. I'll just come around, Lord. May you just give him a bold witness for your sake. May you work through this doctor. May you work through the, the uh, surgery. And may you bring about the healing that he needs, Lord Jesus. We are trusting you for it. Lord, we anoint Bruce in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the sure hope and certain trust that this surgery will be a success, the healing will be quick, and he will continue to serve you with all that he is and with all of his life, Jesus. We give you the praise, and we simply rest in the certain trust and the sure hope that you're going to work out your will in his life, even through this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God is good, and all the time, amen, and he never fails us. We fail sometimes to understand what he's doing and why he's doing it, and it's easy to do, but that's why God has said, trust, trust me, and I really believe it's not that God doesn't want us to know, but there's so many things in this life that are beyond our ability to know. Because all of our lives, look around you, your life is not separate from these lives. Your life is wrapped up in these lives because our lives are wrapped up in Christ. And he binds us together through the bonds of love. Amen? Amen. Reach over, give your neighbor a pat on the back, a hug, a high five or something. And just tell them how much you love them here this morning. Amen. I don't know where I got the microphone. Everybody's got to hear you out in yeah. streamland. That's for sure. I want to praise God for what he did this week. The surgeons came in my room. They said, we're going to take you to surgery bar. We have no choice. He said, in 10 minutes, we're going to weigh you down for surgery again. So we waited and waited seven minutes, and would you know God came in that room? God came in that room in a mighty way, and things began to work. And you should see Dr. Wagner. He says, Barb, we're not only going to thank God, but we're going to praise God for what happened because I'm not so sure what would happen to you. So things began to work, and if that ain't a miracle, I have to tell you what God is doing up there. And for me here, it is so awesome. And here I am, just an old lady, and what can I do? <laughs> but God just brings me back, and I thank him so much. And it's so awesome. I just can't praise him enough. And then here I am, and at home, and here, and I don't know what, what has happened this week. And now when Jane came up to the hospital, and I thought, man, I think this is the way out. I thought I was on my way out. And I felt like I was on my way out. And when they put me in that ambulance and whipped me up to Cleveland, and then I get to that room, and they had all these doctors in this room, and I thought, what in the world? And he says, well, we're going to, you're getting ready for surgery. In 10 minutes, we're welling you down. And wouldn't you know, seven minutes, God moved in that room. Here I am. Would you all indulge me just for a moment and gather around? I'm going to pick on Jeff and Joyce this morning because Jeff's got some dentist work that is going to be done, and Jeff doesn't like the dentist. <laughs> He's the only guy Jeff pays to hurt him. <laughs> so, and Joyce and Jeff have both been dealing with Tom and Ruth, and Ruth's been undergoing some treatments, and uh, so they've had a really tremendous load on them, and they bear it quietly. And they bear it well. And so let's just lift up, gather around. If you're close, a few of you are behind. Lay hands on them and let's pray for our brother and sister, Joyce and Jeff. 
Father, right now we want to lift up to you, Jeff. Lord, I lift up to uh, to you these uh, teeth that have been given a problem. And um, Lord, I lift up to you his hesitation to want to get them treated. And and uh, Lord, we lift up to you the need to be able to afford it, to have the work done. Uh, Lord, as we talked to Joyce yesterday, and she gave testimony that you always provide, and we know you do. But may Jeff and Joyce know, Lord, that they are not going through this trial and this journey alone, that we are their family and our brothers and sisters. May they have the hope and the strength and the peace to know they can lean on us, any one of us, and, and that, Lord, we're here to go through this together. May they feel and sense the prayers of this, their family, lifting them up, encouraging them, strengthening for the challenges they face, Lord. And, Lord, we lift up to you not only Jeff and not only his physical need, we lift up to you, Joyce, and the great burden that she has of of being a caregiver to mom and to dad. We lift up Tom and Ruth to you. Tom and up here in Parkside and the struggles with dementia that he has and his physical struggles. And Lord, we lift up to you, Ruth, and some of the changes that have been going on in her and she doesn't understand and the doctors don't at this point, but give them wisdom and discernment. And, and Lord, I thank you and praise you that Tom and Ruth have such a tremendous testimony of you as their Lord and Savior. May they be strengthened and encouraged through their faith in you during this part of the journey they're on in this life. For this life, Lord, is simply temporary. And as they are a part of a journey, Lord, that takes them to you, we thank you, Lord, that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that their hope in you is firm and secure and trust that they are in the center of your will for their lives. See them through. And in this time of weakness, be perfected, Lord Jesus, in their faith and through their faith. So, Lord, this morning we anoint Joyce in the name of the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit, the sure hope and certain trust that she can find strength in her moment of struggle or weakness as you give her wisdom and discernment about how to lead and how to be the daughter, how to be, Lord Jesus, the, the person of faith that you've called her to be in her family's life. And Lord, we anoint Jeff in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as he is a helpmate and a help to Joyce and shares this load with her. And we lift up, Lord, his physical need right now and trust and sure hope and certain trust that your will is and will be done in both of their lives. Thank you for them. Thank you for their faith. Thank you for them as our family. Strengthen them and may they be encouraged and uplifted this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, God's still good. All the time. And all the time. Amen. Well, this is your service, and I'm just obedient to what God calls us to do. Sometimes I'm even obedient to what Shelly calls me to do. Not very often. I guess I have a question. Do you think Rich would be uncomfortable sitting up front all the time? Rich, oh, well, I think he's, he's, he's probably good wherever you want to put him. Well, I have him up front there. Oh. No, he's 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 good. He's good. Thank you. Awesome. And that's that's a great idea. Uh, I didn't even see it until you just said it there. It was sitting there. Awesome. Yeah. And you know what? It's a tremendous thing if we just be aware of the seats. Look at the seats around you, because sometimes if you take the time to stop at prayer time or in the morning in worship, you might realize somebody's not there who you were used to seeing there. And a phone call and a card and a visit makes a powerful difference. And I know in some ways, I've I got to be honest with you, sometimes I struggle as a pastor because I'd love to spend my time visiting with everyone who's not here all the time. And I often find that my schedule doesn't allow it, and it forces me into some bad decisions. Uh, not bad decisions, but tough decisions because I want to be with you, and I can't do it alone. I really need your help because I just feel overwhelmed sometimes with those who I see needs in their lives and I want to be there. And uh, when we pull together as the body, what a powerful statement we make. Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by how great a pastor you have. They'll know you're my disciples by what a great facility you have. They'll know you're my disciples by all the awesome programs that you offer to the community. No, they'll know you are my disciples by the way you love each other. That's the statement of what it means to know Christ. 
And guys, you do a wonderful job. But let's never, never get satisfied in the way that we love. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, it's time to receive the offering this morning. And as the ushers come, is there one who would just simply like to get up and lead in the offertory prayer for us this morning? I thought I thought Dawn was getting up to lead. Apparently, he is. So. <laughs> Sometimes, when your feet move too quick, you find yourself in a place you should. Well, that you'd you not should desire be. to be. But it's always great to give thanks to the Lord. So let us pray, Heavenly Father. We just thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for the many blessings. But Lord, most of all, thank you for the life that you lived in the life that you gave for us so that we might, Lord, that we might have eternity, a life and eternity lived with you, Lord. Thank you for your spirit that is so overwhelming today. Lord, help us to do your will. Lord, I just thank you for this offering that is about to be taken. Lord, I pray that we would give with cheerful hearts. And Lord, may you use it in the way that you desire. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We are waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, and still you know my heart. You're the author of salvation. You've loved us from the start. I'm waiting here for you. With our hands lifted high in praise. And it's you.
today. Amen. Amen. When Marley was 18 months old, she had been exhibiting symptoms that really concerned Nikki and me. And so we took her to the doctor a couple of times and found um, that she had uh, a cancerous brain tumor. And the tumor was really aggressive uh, and it was hard to combat with chemotherapy and other traditional methods. The uh, brain surgeon tried to remove as much of the tumor as they could from her. And uh, in the process, she ended up having a stroke uh, due to all of the trauma involved with the surgery uh, on the night uh, that she had that surgery. And uh, Marley went through uh, a great deal in her short period of time on this earth. Uh, she lived to be three and a half years old. So from the time she was 18 months to, to three and a half, she taught Nikki and me so many important lessons about life. Uh, she taught me personally that, that life is short and that uh, we are only guaranteed this one moment in time. And uh, we, we don't have any guarantee beyond that. And uh, so it's really been a challenge to me to live moment by moment. In, in God's uh, grace and, and, and presence uh, and, and live a life that's fully devoted to Him. And she was on a lot of different medications and she had so many reasons to, to complain, but she was always, uh, almost always positive. Uh, she would say hi to, to people she didn't know, complete strangers, and she lived in the moment. You would never know that she spent the, the night beforehand throwing up and, and, and being sick, and, and uh, it really pushed me to, to become uh, a, a better person. The whole situation was very hard and, and, and really traumatic. Um, it shook the foundation of of, of everything that, that we believed in. It stirred it up. And um, I, I would be lying if I said I still don't feel pain that she is gone. But um, even though she's not with us anymore, God is, is first in, in our lives. God is first in, in my life. And um, I can claim Christ is number one. I hope that uh, you've gotten your book and you're reading along with us and being challenged by this concept, this notion that we've known for so long, this phrase that is easy for us to say as Christians, Jesus is Lord. And many of us have said it many, many times over. But the question is, what's the real message of our lives? What's the real message of our heart? We live in a world where we're inundated with messages. There is the Internet. There's, and on the Internet, there's YouTube. There's, there's Vine. There's Facebook. There's, there's uh, commercials and television and cable television and network television and all sorts of messages. And in the world in which we live in, it can be pretty confusing to figure out what's the truth. One of my favorite commercials is, and I can't even remember what the product was, but I just remember where the girl was out and she's talking about this, this, and that, and, and the guy is saying, oh, really, is that true? And she says, oh, yeah, I read it on the Internet, and they can't put it on the Internet if it's not true. And uh, it's, uh, she says, oh, I'll go with my boyfriend. He's a French model, and this really homely guy comes along, and uh, he says, where did you find him? And he's, she said, the Internet. <laughs> and the really homely guy says, wee oui, wee, oui, you know, and walks off with the girl. 
And it's amazing how it's so easy to receive so many messages, but where is the truth in all of that? Where is the truth behind the messages that we're inundated with? And this morning, we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And as we look in the book of Matthew, we find Jesus and his disciples and Jesus has been with his disciples for some time, and this is getting near the end of the last few weeks of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he spent three years with his disciples and teaching and preaching and educating them and, and showing them the miraculous things, miraculous signs. And, and uh, after uh, some of these events, Jesus is sitting down and debriefing with his disciples, and he asked them a very poignant question. And this is what we come to right here in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus then says, But what about you, he asked. Who do you say? I am. And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And the truth is, and there's a phrase now called post Christian culture. Post Christian culture is a culture that, at some point in time, the predominant faith or religion of that culture was Christianity, whether it was through Catholicism or Protestantism. But we're living in a day and age where many, many of those formerly Christian in uh, Christian engulfed cultures, and and it's a little bit like an American culture. And, and as early as probably a hundred years ago in this country, whether you were a Christian or not, you were a part of a Christ-centered culture. Our laws the morality, the social norms, the social standards were all largely based on the precepts of Christianity and the Ten Commandments. But we're coming to a day and age where uh, many of these formerly Christ-centered cultures, in terms of the, the, the uh, kind of the philosophy that ran the culture, is becoming a post-Christian culture. What does that mean? It means that Christ is no longer the center, that the philosophy of Judeo-Christian values no longer determine the morality or the social standards of the culture. And folks, I want to tell you, we are sitting in a day and age, and I'm living to see it in my time, where we are largely in American culture, a part of a post-Christian culture. It's not that Jesus is completely out, but now Jesus is just one of the options for us. And the question that Jesus asked the disciples is a very poignant question for us. Who is it that people say I am? And the survey says, are you familiar with that show? When Jesus came to the region, he asked, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus was drawing towards the close of his earthly ministry, and he was asking this poignant question because he wanted to know what was filtering through. Now, his disciples were sitting in the crowd often when he taught and when he fed the 4,000 and the 5,000, and, and when he raised Lazarus, called for the grave for Lazarus to come forth, and, and when he brought healing of the lame, and, and uh, you remember the man was lowered through the roof, and he said, get up, your sins are forgiven, and the disciples were a part of this crowd, and there were some really fantastic, miraculous things going on, so they would be in tune to hearing the whispers. They would be in tune to the side conversations that were going on. There were questions, and people were saying, oh, what about, who is this man, and, and what is he doing? And it's an age-old question. What do your friends, schoolmates, or workmates say? Who do they say Jesus is. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. I want you to think about somebody you work with. I want you to think about the people, some of you teenagers and younger kids, the kids that you're in school with, you college students, the people that are next to you in the dorm, not only in the class, and your professors, the people that are surrounding your life, your circle of relationships. Who do those people say Jesus is? What is the response that you think they would give? 
what would they have to say about him and how would they regard him? If Jesus met with you this morning and asked you that question, who do your friends say I am, how would you answer him? Think about it for just a moment. And one of the other questions I would ask is, where are they getting their information? The internet? Because if it's not true, they can't put it on the internet. Can I get a witness? They put a lot of stuff on the internet. And if half of it was true, I'd be really shocked and amazed and terrified. So who would your friends say that Jesus is and where would they get their information? And when the disciples gave Jesus their answer, they said, basically, one among many. They talked about John the Baptist and Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. So the people regarded Jesus as pretty high up on the list. I mean, in this culture, and remember, this was a God-centered culture. These were people who went to the temple and worshipped, and they knew Moses and revered Moses, and John the Baptist was pretty high up on their list. Even though John the Baptist wasn't popular among the religious leaders of the day, the people hailed him as a, a, an incredible prophet of God, a man of God. And so the people said, well, we think that this Jesus has got to be like one of these other guys. Really, really righteous and, and really close with God and, and really tuned in to what God is saying. And, and man, he's got some good stuff and, and he's got some really good things to listen to. And, and he's got a great MP3 up on the internet. And he's got a really great ebook that you can download to your reader. And he's got some really cool things to say. And, and, and it kind of reminds me of, of uh, a while back when uh, the uh, NBC was trying to do some biblical stuff and and make some money off of some biblical things, and they did the story of, of uh, Noah and the ark. And, and I remember uh, Jay Leno talking about it. He said, yeah, yeah, the, the, the movie and everything about Noah, he said it was so popular, and, and the passion of Christ is so popular, they, they've decided to write a book about it. Sink in, the book was already written. And so often people look and they think that he's got some great things to say, but he's just one He's just one among many. He's just one voice among many good voices. And I would say that that incredibly describes the culture that we live in today. Most of the people that you work with, if you ask them what they thought about Jesus, they would probably say, yeah, yeah, he's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, maybe they'd say, who? You know, Jesus? Jesus? Is, is he the guy that works down at the restaurant? Who, who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about here? Is that a major league ball player? I don't know who you're talking about. Or maybe they'd say, oh, Jesus, I love Jesus. I can't stand the church, but man, I love Jesus. And a lot of people feel that way. And we are living in a culture today where Jesus is simply one among many. Good, righteous, even holy people. But he's just one among a very select, very good, but just one among the many. And the, the, the many of the people who had heard him preach and teach and work miracles simply regarded him just like one of the prophets of the past. God was using him, yes. God had great things to say t through him, yes, but he's just one among the many. They knew the message well. They knew what they needed to do. They were ready to file his message in the one among many file, and then move on to the next great preacher. And I meet folks that are in this category all the time in my life. Yeah, he's, oh, yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, you should love one another. Sure, that's right. Yeah, yeah, oh man, you shouldn't lust, you know? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be mean to people. Yeah, you should be forgiving. Yeah, those, those are really great things. He had a lot of great things to say. I'll, I'm going to file that right away here, and then I'm moving on with my life. Many, many people live with this understanding of who Christ is in their life. He knew the message. We know the message. We hear the words. We hear it preached on Sunday morning. We hear it through the words of the songs. We see it in our life groups or as we're doing the engage the word. We see it. We hear it. We know it. File it and move on. And many people do. 
And the question I want you to take and ask yourself is, how do your friends regard Jesus? How do they see him? How do they know him? Are they in the same category? And here's the real question I want to ask you this morning. How is the relationship that you have with them, how is it influencing their opinion about who he is? How is your relationship with Jesus determining their opinion about who Jesus really is? Because if they're not getting that opinion from you as a professed believer in Christ, as a professed follower of Christ, where are they getting it? And if they're getting it somewhere else, is the life that they see lived out in the relationship you have with Christ, is it challenging their notion of who Jesus is? Or is it confusing their notion? What difference is the relationship you have with them making a difference about their relationship to who they believe Jesus is? A generation or two ago in society, everyone knew who Christ was, and they had their own personal opinion of who he is. Some might honor him as Lord, and some might pay lip service. They may not pay much attention. However, they did not act as if he didn't exist a generation or two ago. Think about how drastically the world has changed in your lifetime. I'm 46 years of age, and I can tell you, from 1967 when I was born to 2013, there has been radical, dramatic culture shift in our nation and in our world. And it's not because Jesus doesn't matter anymore. Honestly, I think it's more about how much Jesus mattered to previous generations. Well, the third thing, can I get a witness? Jesus then moved on from the crowd, and he moved to the disciples. He looked them straight in the eye, and he said, okay, okay, they don't know me. They've heard me preach. They've heard me teach. I get it. They have their opinions. But you've been with me. I called you. I called you by name. You have been with me through thick and thin. You've been with me in the storm. You've been with me in the, through my temptation. You've, you've been with me through the difficult days that I've faced. You are with me in the miracles. You're with me with the feeding of the thousands. You're with me with raising the dead to life. Now I want to know, here's the question, who do you say I am? Who do you say that Jesus is this morning? The most important message of the scripture passage comes in verse 15 when Jesus pushed his disciples to the point of making their own decision. And as we start this journey, and then over the next six weeks, we're going to be asking ourselves, what does that look like to say Jesus is Lord? And one of the disciples, and of course Peter, you know Peter, he's got to jump in. He's got to put his two cents in before anybody else can even say anything. He immediately speaks up and, and he says, you are the Messiah. You are the one. You are the one who gives life. And, and I love the passage in John and, and Peter again. And the disciples spoke up and it was Peter in John chapter 6 when many quit following Jesus. And, and he said, are you also going to abandon me? And Peter said, where would we go? To whom could we turn? You have the very words of life. And I want to ask you this morning, who do you say Jesus is this morning? Who do you say? That Jesus asked you, what about you? Who do you say I am? Through Peter's confession, it becomes a model for us to say, Jesus is Lord as our own confession. And you have to understand something. Unless, Jesus said, unless the Spirit, unless the Spirit speaks to you, you can't confess. Unless the Spirit draws you. And Peter said, Jesus, you are Lord. You are the Savior. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, for you didn't figure this out on your own. It wasn't because you were smarter than the other 11 disciples. It wasn't because you had a better education behind you. It wasn't because you had more letters at the end of your name or spent more time reading your Bible or spent more time going to church. This is not from you. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God has revealed this to you. Not flesh and blood, not through your own strength, but the Spirit of God has revealed this to you. 
And if our confession is going to be that of Peter's confession this morning, it's only as the Spirit of God gives us the unction or the knowledge to speak it. The Spirit of God gave Peter understanding and insight beyond his own natural abilities. <clears throat> we must remember that what was true for Peter is true for us. Only the Spirit of God can give us the insight and the words we need to give a clear witness to the world about who Jesus Christ really is. Jesus wants us to share our witness with him to our friends, our loved ones, and anyone else. But that can only be ring true. It can only be real as the Spirit speaks through us. <clears throat> I've been challenged this morning because of what happened yesterday to turn this light on. Because yesterday this, this was a wedding chapel. Yesterday this was uh, a wedding for a friend of mine, a young man who I've known for 15 years. I've known this young man for 15 years because he started playing basketball in this gym when I first came as youth pastor. His best man, I learned to know him because he played basketball in Natonia. Then he came and played basketball here. I come to know other people in his wedding party. There's about four young men, and as we had the wedding in here yesterday, several of them were at the back of me talking. They're like, oh, man, this gym used to look so big when we were kids. Now I can't believe that we used to play ball in here every Friday night. And I can't believe and the one young man, Greg, was talking to me. He says, oh, remember how you had the circle and how we used to wrestle every Friday night? He said, we'd all have rug burns all over our arms and knees. I said, dude, I had like permanent rug burns for 10 years from wrestling on this carpet. And what I realized between last night and today is the light of Christ doesn't come on in a single moment. The light of Christ comes on over years of planting seed, over years of confessing who Christ is, not simply with our lips but with our lives. I want some of you to know who are concerned about loved ones, and maybe you've had friends for a really long time, and, and I wish I could say that the, the, this wedding yesterday was the culmination of, of every one of these young men confessing Christ as their Lord and Savior, and it isn't. But they're on a journey, and they're hearing the message, Jesus is Lord. They're seeing the message, Jesus is Lord. I was grateful to get to stand up here yesterday and in front of a crowd that I would say hardly any of them know Christ as their Savior to speak about God's love for us, God's love for them, God's hope for this marriage, God wanting to take the brokenness of our lives and form them together to a beautiful tapestry of love. Who do you say Jesus is? For the last 2,000 years of church history, God has asked of Christian believers, can I get a witness? Can you speak for me? Can you love for me? Can you suffer for me? For me, can you experience loss for me? Can you sit by and watch your three and a half year old daughter die and succumb to cancer and still say to the world around you, My faith has been shaken, my world is upside down, but Jesus still is the Lord of my life. He's my hope, He's my peace. He is the comfort that I need when I can't understand the hurt inside. He is still my Lord. And Jesus is asking you and me this morning, can I get a witness? Can we go beyond lip service? Can we go beyond convenience? Can we go beyond when I have time, when I can work it out, if it doesn't cost too much, if it doesn't take too much, if I'm not too busy, if it doesn't bother me, can we go beyond and can I get a witness 
Who do you say Jesus is? Because the world is listening to your answer. The world is watching your answer. Can I get a witness? <laughs> what really matters to him is how we, his followers, regard him. Who do we say he is? And what place do we give him in our lives? This morning I had to make an addendum. Well, actually about midnight last night to this message because I was reading my U version and my Bible in a year scripture was late last night. In the book of Judges, in the second chapter, verse 10, I came across this little blurb. And before this blurb, it said the angel of the Lord had went up with Joshua, and the Lord, the, the God, uh, the angel of the Lord addressed the assembly of Israel and said, Hey, look, you haven't really been doing what I asked you to do. You haven't been serving me like I've asked you to serve. You've been being mixed up with these other gods and distracted, and, and I'm a little disappointed in you. And he gave them the speech, and they went on from there, and Joshua told the people, go and inherit the land, and go and take the land, and so forth and so on. And then it says Joshua died, and the whole generation of those who had seen God bring the people out of Egypt, and the whole generation of those who had seen the hand of God deliver over them the land time and time again, and, and had fought for them against their enemies, that generation passed away. And then this scripture caught my eye. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, other gods. They forsook the Lord and the God of their fathers. In a generation's time, they went from the God who could deliver them through the Red Sea to not knowing this God at all. And what struck me about that as I read that, and what struck me about the message this morning was that question, who do you say I am? What must have been going on in the life of the fathers that they didn't pass down to the generation that was falling in their footsteps? This is who God is. Jesus is Lord. God is the Lord of my life. And in as little as a generation, he was gone. The message was gone. The answer was gone. And they forsook the Lord because they didn't know him. Why not? It strikes at the core of my heart to think of my boys growing up and as they are coming into adulthood and, and they're 30 and 40 years of age living a life that denies everything that meant something to me because Jesus is my Lord. If that were to happen, I would be crushed because I would know that I had not said it enough. I had not lived it enough. I had not believed it enough. Something must have gone wrong. I don't want my boys being in any way confused about Jesus as Lord. I don't want your sons and your daughters. I don't want a generation or two generations or six generations from now having any doubt about who Jesus is in their life, about how much God loves them. Because I've seen what the world offers. And I'm sorry I'm emotional about this today. But yesterday just brought a lot of things real in me. And as I sit there during the wedding, and as I sit there during the reception, I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, 15 years, 15 years of Jesus is Lord, and still so many don't know. Still so many are looking to everything but him. Still so many live lives that are here, and they're gone, and what's to show for it? I don't save anybody, but my heart breaks for those who don't listen, who don't get a hold, who don't know the message that Jesus is Lord. And folks, we are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the ministers of reconciliation. If we don't do it, who? If not now, when? It's a big question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Not here, but here. But here, you can say it here all day long. You can sit in this church all day long. But how you act at home, 
how you speak to your children, to your spouse, to your parents. That's the testimony of who Jesus is in your life. How you spend your time, how you spend your resources, how you conduct yourself in social media and at work and at school, that's the real testimony of who you say Jesus is. Who do you say Jesus is this morning? My prayer and my hope is that we're telling our kids when one generation cannot, does not sufficiently give the answer to Jesus' question, who do you say I am? The next generation will grow to not know him at all. It's the truth. It's the reality. This morning... And every morning, I hope that you join me. And with one voice, we stand and proclaim this one thing. Joining our voices with the millions of voices from the past, we proclaim boldly, passionately, fervently, zealously, that Jesus is the Lord of this life. Jesus is the Lord of these hands. Jesus is the Lord of these eyes and ears. Jesus is the Lord of this mouth and everything that proceeds from it. But he can't be the Lord there if he's not the Lord of this. For out of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus said. And if he's not Lord of this, if he's not Lord here, he's not your Lord. He's your friend, he's your savior, he's your greatest hope. He might even be your buddy. But if he's not Lord here, he's not your Lord anywhere. This morning, as we close, I would ask you this question. And as we go into the next week, as you read through the chapters leading up to next week, Think and examine your own life. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I want you to think about your life last week. And as you lived out your life last week, where in that life was Jesus being proclaimed as your Lord? To your Christian friends? To your pastor? But what about your spouse? What about your kids? What about your neighbor? What about your enemies? Was your life proclaiming Jesus is Lord to them? Love those who persecute you, do good those to those who harm you. <laughs> Love one another as I have loved you, forgiving as I have forgiven you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in all humility humble yourselves as Christ humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the death, the death of my will, the death of my way or the highway, the death of my plan. And I want you to ask yourself, and I want you to examine yourself this coming week and if it takes a piece of paper and a pencil or writing it in your smartphone or on your tablet, I want you to examine yourself at the end of every day and ask yourself that question every day for the next seven days. Who do I say Jesus is? Who does my life say Jesus is? And I don't want it, the words from your mouth. I want the work of your hands the path of your feet, the passions of your heart this week. Who do you say Jesus is? Father, we thank you for this time to be together today. We thank you, Lord, that you hear us and you know our burdens, you know our struggles, you know our weaknesses, and yet you have loved us and not only loved us but called us 
You've loved us for who we are, where we are, but have loved us far too much to leave us there. And you call us to a higher plane of living, not by our performance, by what rather we are willing to receive from you, whether we are willing or not to let you be the Lord of our life, and as you are Lord of our life, to direct the path of our feet, to direct the work of our hands, and to direct the words of our mouth, the thoughts of our mind, and the passions of our heart in such a way that our whole life, our whole being, the testimony of who we are in this church, in our homes, in our world, everywhere, is that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Now, the second place, not challenged by loss, not challenged by hurt, not challenged by need, but rather, Lord, you are Lord. Where else would we go? You have the words of life, of peace, of hope, of salvation. Father, may we begin this journey by settling that question in our hearts and in our lives. Who rules? Who rules the roost in our lives, in our hearts? May the answer always be, Jesus is Lord. May we be your witnesses in all the ends of the earth, proclaiming salvation, freedom, hope to all those downtrodden and weary with the burdens of this life. We give you praise. We give you the glory and the honor this day for this time together. Bless us as we go to our life groups. May we be mindful of this week of those who were not here with us. May we reach out to our brothers and sisters and love them as you have loved us. And may we love everyone you send across our path on the way from here to next week. May we say with all we are to them, each and every one, Jesus, you are Lord. Go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. And as God's people said, amen, amen. God I bless think you. It would, be, would, it, would you mind if we sang that? No. The second no, verse it. of the stand? Because that's making a commitment. I believe that chorus. Would you stand with us? Sing the We're words. We're going to say that prayer. Jesus is Lord today. Let's sing just the second chorus, the second verse in the chorus. You stood before my fear. Aren't you glad he did? And carried the cross for my shame. Praise the Lord. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stay. So what can I say? And what can I do but offer this heart, oh God, completely, completely to you? And show him this morning that he is Lord in your life. So I'll stand with arms high and heart open. Of the one who gave it all, I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. Let's sing it again. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who As you're dismissed this morning, let me ask you a question and give me the vocal response. Who is Lord? Jesus. Go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus.